So one of the reasons why um, religion can be so important is because of its association with other factors. And in the previous lecture, we talked about the relationship between religion and patterns of inequality. So how religion and inequality related to one another. And in this lecture, what I want us to talk, think about a little bit is um, uh, how religion is also intertwined with politics. And so I'm giving as an example an American case uh, from the 2016 election. And to think about how there's a relationship between religion and what we sometimes call in the US the culture wars um, or uh, differences between the cultural attitudes of people and how those are associated with religion. So if you look, for example, at exit polls from the 2016 election uh, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you see that exit polls showed that more than 80% of evangelical Christians um, uh, um, uh, voted for uh, Trump. And that's um, uh, um, uh, um, all evangelical Christians. If we break this down, we see that it's mostly white evangelicals. So, um, uh, and if you look, uh, for example, at uh, Trump's refugee policy, um, uh, which was a policy to stop refugees and to prevent people from seven majority Muslim countries from entering um, the United States, you see that overall the policy is pretty unpopular. 60% um, of the people, almost 60% of the people disapprove of the policy. You see, as might be fairly um, uh, predictable, that there's a big uh, political divide, that Republicans, the party that Trump is far from, are highly supportive of it, with 81% supporting. And Democrats, or people at least who lean Democrat, are very much against it, um, uh, almost 90%. And so some of this has to do with the policy and some of this has to do with politics. But if we break this down by religion, we see something very interesting. Um, Protestants are pretty evenly split in terms of their policy of stopping refugees and preventing people from majority Muslim countries entering the, the US. Um, uh, and yet it's not the case that that 50% is equivalent for all Protestants. Um, because if you look at black Protestants, for example, um, which includes um, black evangelicals, 84% are opposed to the policy. And by contrast, if you look at white evangelicals, 76% are in favor of the policy. Now, you know, the reason some of this is interesting is because um, uh, uh, in, the story of Christ, Jesus is a refugee. Um, he's actually a political refugee. Um, his parents are, as um, they flee political oppression in order for him to be born. And so, um, uh, you know, you, you would imagine that um, uh, Christians may be more supportive of this. And yet we see, um, you know, really interesting patterns where white Catholics have different attitudes than Hispanic Catholics that's not that surprising and that the unaffiliated are particularly not supportive of these policies. But overall, what I'd like you to know is that um, there tends to be religious patterning um, uh, along political lines, but that that religious patterning is intersectional. So in previous lectures, we've talked about intersectionality that we can't understand single variables alone, or rather that single variables often intersect with other variables. In a lecture on intersectionality, I talked about another way of thinking about this, which is to think about interaction effects, how variables interact with one another in order to create different kinds of dynamics. But either conceptualization, either the intersectional approach or the interactionalist approach suggests that, that um, religion intersects with things like race and other kinds of variables to help predict how people act politically. So, you know, there's a strong relationship with the religiously unaffiliated and politics in particular. Uh, the religiously unaffiliated, meaning people who maybe identify as atheists, but maybe don't, they just don't identify with a particular religion. Researchers find that there's a growing number of religious nuns. And these are people that is, they have no religion. 
these are people who are raised religiously but reject the re affiliation as a reaction in part to the religious life. Uh, right, excuse me. Um, and so a question would be, what is the source of this divide? Um, uh, and, you know, many argue that these kinds of divides are leading to a culture war between white conservative Protestants and progressives who are less and less affiliated with organized religion. And so some of the politics of whiteness in the United States is a politics also of religion. Um, but I'll note that when people talk about evangelical Protestants, what they typically mean are white evangelical Protestants because black evangelical Protestants and Hispanic evangelical Protestants have different trends. So um, it's important to be relatively specific about the groups that we're talking about. And also to note that religion is associated not just with patterns of inequality, but with major religious div uh, political divisions in the United States. I'll say that again, religion is associated with major political divisions in the United States. Um, and uh, um, so uh, one of the things that we look at in the US in terms of US politics is how this is playing out um, with different political parties, with different political policies, uh, et cetera. Now, the politics of religion is also related to gender and sexuality. So recently, the issue of contraception pitted women's rights against religious freedom. A Supreme Court case involved the Little Sisters of the Poor who argued that they should not have to provide contraception to employees working in their nursing homes. So they shouldn't have to provide access to birth control as part of the health care that they were required to provide to their workers or offer as, as an option for their workers. The six sisters argued that even the Obama administration's compromise that allowed them not to cover the devices and medications, but for their employees to obtain them for free from the federal government was a violation of their religious beliefs and the American right to religious freedom. The Little Sisters case came on the heels of a Hobby Lobby case where the company sued for and won the right not to provide access to some medications and devices they considered to be abortion induced. And the politics here is a politics of abortion. Um, uh, and that politics of abortion is tied to uh, politics of providing certain kinds of contraception because the ways that certain kinds of contraception work is not to prevent conception of children, but instead to um, uh, uh, allow for or to um, have women have their period even after they've conceived a child. Um, and so some people on the religious right will consider this an abortion. Um, and therefore they won't wanna support certain kinds of medications or devices that may facilitate this. So conservative religious groups generally oppose abortion. They also oppose feminism and homosexuality, the broader LGBTQ community. Um, and although both, although the proponents of the two cases argued that they were about religious freedom, they're also about sexual conservatism and women's rights. And so progressive religious groups and non-religious uh, uh, people support in general abortion uh, feminism and uh, the rights of LGBTQ people. I'll note that um, actually the support for abortion in the United States is very strong. Uh, um, a majority of people are supportive of abortion. Um, it is a very, very active minority um, that is opposed to it. And, but the divisions between religion and these gender and sexuality dynamics become most apparent when laws are involved. So as the federal government began to be more involved in the provision of health care, in providing health care for people, fights over uh, the kinds of things that the federal government would pay for as part of its health care became more and more vigorous, more and more um, 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 uh, passionate. Uh, this opposition of uh, conservative religious groups to abortion, feminism, um, and homosexuality is also something that has waxed and waned. And so, you know, one of the things that you might want to look into if you're really interested in this 
is how abortion became such a major hot button political issue and polarizing um, uh, because it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, it's a relatively recent phenomenon and it's also deeply American. Um, uh, so other nations, if we were to look at Germany, for example, um, the, this response to abortion is not nearly as strong with um, uh, right-wing political movements. Um, and, and so there's a coupling of religion and particular kinds of politics that are part of political processes. And if you're really interested in this, we'll talk a little bit about it in future lectures on political sociology. We also can't understand um, religion today without thinking about violence. And this is a fairly evocative image of um, uh, the attack on the World Trade Centers in New York of, um, uh, um, uh, by uh, Al-Qaeda, really by um, a group that identifies as a, as a kind of um, extremist Muslim group committed to violence. And we sadly know that many lives have been lost due to terrorism and to um, um, uh, the US's commitment to uh, uh, a kind of religious violence. Um, uh, and what research has generally shown is that all religions have the potential to justify or be used to justify violence. Um, and uh, the rhetoric around the 2001 um, um, and then subsequent Iraq war was very much not just a rhetoric of Muslim violence against the United States, but um, of uh, a, a kind of holy war on the part of the United States against uh, parts of the Muslim world. And um, the rhetoric that we deploy uh, is not always as obviously religious, um, but our willingness to kill people in other parts of the world is in part tied to what the religion of those people is. Um, that over the course of, um, um, since 1993 through today, um, uh, the United States has killed hundreds of thousands of Muslims throughout the um, Middle East uh, and other associated areas. And I would opine that we would be relatively unwilling to do this if those people were Christians. And so some of our willingness to engage in political violence is tied to the religion of the people that we're um, engaging in violence against. Um, and so we need to think about why it is that religion is so politically polarizing for people, why it is that it's associated with such political cleavages. Importantly, um, uh, uh, we see religious violence existing not just in the uh, case of, um, uh, say, Muslims and Christians, but um, also within religious traditions. So some of the most dramatic instances of um, religious violence uh, recently um, in the last 40 years were committed by Catholics and Protestants against each other in um, Ireland and in England. Um, so the IRA, the Irish Republican Army was responsible for numerous anti-Protestant terrorist attacks in Ireland, um, as well as in England, um, uh, bombing cafes uh, and um, things like that. Um, uh, uh, Baruch Goldstein was an American Israeli terrorist responsible for the 1994 cave of a Patriarch's Massacre, walking into a mosque and killing dozens of Muslims who were praying. And uh, Shoko Ashahara was the reader of a Buddhist cult who was responsible for the Tokyo subway nerve gas attack. And so we should think about how all religions are, excuse me, um, how all religions have the capacity to commit violence and um, uh, that some of uh, this capacity to commit violence has to do with the sort of, um, uh, uh, not necessarily the depth of religious commitment, um, which is one way of thinking about it. Uh, uh, because religious leaders would often argue that um, people who are willing to commit violence in the name of a religion are not in fact deeply committed to the religion. 
Instead, they're deeply committed to something else, and then they use religion to justify those actions. So we shouldn't necessarily think about the relationship between religion and violence as those people who are deeply committed to religion who are more likely to commit violence. Instead, we might ask how it is that religion can serve as a framework for people who are deeply committed to committing violence as, as a framework of justification. If you recall back to the culture section of our lectures, um, if you listen to them, in, in one of them, I talked about the work of Anne Swidler, who described culture as a toolkit, culture as a set of resources that we can draw upon in order to navigate our way through the world. And um, a perspective here about the relationship between religion and violence is to think about religion as part of the toolkit that people can draw upon, a toolkit of justification. Um, and so here, the explanation would not be that religion necessarily causes violence, but instead that religion is a resource that some can draw upon in order to justify violence, in order to justify violence as part of a holy war, as part of a transformation of some place that they want to see. Um, uh, in this, sense, uh, uh, the relationship between religion and violence is a complicated one. What's not complicated is that religion often serves as or is associated with those different groups that are likely to commit violence against one another. Now, this doesn't mean that Christians never commit violence against Christians. Um, we see, for example, attacks in the American South on black churches by white Christians. And so there's certainly a willingness to do that. Or we see in the case of the IRA, a commitment of Irish Catholics to commit violence against Protestants, um, Protestant civilians as part of a political struggle. Um, so it's not that people within uh, uh, religious groups never commit violence against one another. But we can also see the bright symbolic boundaries between groups in so far as we observe instances of violence between them. In conclusion, um, we should think about religion as part of our social structure and um, how it intersects with things like class, race, ethnicity, gender, and politics that it remains an important political force, both domestically and, it, uh, and uh, international uh, political force. Even as many in the 60s and 70s predicted an increase in secularization, um, which is to say, it's a different way of saying, a decrease in the power of religion over everyday life we certainly could not tell the story of the last 40 years without also telling the story of religion. Um, we see across the world today, so much of what is happening is associated with religion. In the United States, political processes and inequality are deeply entwined with inequality, with uh, religion, excuse me. In China currently, there is a series of political actions that are deeply associated with uh, the group of people who are Muslims and that though that we cannot understand what is happening relative to a series of camps without thinking about those group of people as Muslims. In and throughout the Middle East, the struggles over the Middle East are fundamentally about religion, about a relationship between Jews and Muslims and control over land. In international conflict, as I said before, one cannot understand the, the US's willingness to do large scale political violence against groups without knowing what the religion of those groups are. Um, and so all of the claims about processes of secularization of how we have become less religious may be true in part in our daily lives, some aspects of our daily lives, um, for many of us certainly have less religion embedded within them 
than they did, say, two generations ago. But religion is deeply enmeshed in our social structure. It's enmeshed in structures of class and inequality, differences across racial and ethnic groups, gender and how uh, different people understand things like feminism, the LGBTQ community, and most of all, politics, both domestic politics and international politics. Um, as a sociologist who does not study re religion, religion is not part of the work that I do, um, I will say that I think that um, uh, I think there's far too little work done in sociology on religion. Um, that is a major, major political, economic, cultural force. Um, and uh, its popularity within sociology has declined. And I hope that for some of the people listening along and, 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 and being part of this lecture, that you think about maybe religion as an area that you might do work in. Um, because I think there's a lot of opportunity to do work in this area, in part because it's such an important area uh, um, um, for understanding our contemporary social world.